potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have Nunzio Presta. He runs mybizon.com, which his site's called BizOn, right? And so he actually sells, buys and sells different, um, I think it's offline and online businesses, which is so amazing and unique considering most of us think that we have to be startups in order to start our own business, but you don't have to. You can buy one. So thanks so much for coming on the show today, Nunzio. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. How the heck do you come up with this idea? It's kind of rare. Yeah, it, it, it well, yeah, it is. And um, it, it kind of comes back to my journey. Uh, I used to be, uh, you know, to go back in, in the day, I used to be a semi-pro hockey goalie. Uh, fast forward, the, the career didn't go the way I wanted to. So I found myself in business school uh, where I started this little, little company with a friend of mine. And we got to the point where... Um, it was, it was pretty good, but we didn't have the expertise or resources to actually grow it to that next level. So I started looking for ways to try and sell it. And, um, you know, I'd be shut down by, by realtors that were more focused on selling homes or business brokers that wanted multi-million dollar listings. Uh, and then publicly announcing it to, to everyone, I felt uncomfortable doing that. So, um, I, I did my research, I dug into it a little bit more and, and uh, I said, wow, you know, there's really no online community or marketplace where people could easily search for little small uh, business opportunities or franchise opportunities or simply try and sell it themselves. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's, I went for it. Um, and now, you know, we've had multiple versions since that day, but uh, it's really morphed into a, a really dynamic, resourceful, uh, seamless and, and, and supportive marketplace where not only entrepreneurs and, and, and business owners can leverage, but we're also seeing a ton of business brokers and franchisors leveraging it as well as a, as a marketing tool. What year was that, by the way? So I founded the company in 2012, uh, and then I was on a journey for a good year and a half uh, trying to, you know, uh, attract the right team to bring my vision to reality. Uh, and we officially launched in 2014. Um, and yeah, the rest is history now. So what's your business model on this too? Because we've had a couple guys that are business brokers, which makes a lot of sense. But if mm -hmm. you even have business brokers that buy on your website too, where, where does your cash come in on the business model side? So yeah, so what we do is um, we look at ourselves as that matchmaker. So we're we're along that journey, um, that buying or selling journey. Uh, but we never we never tell someone, hey, you know, just use us. We think it's very important to leverage professionals. Uh, we think it's very important to leverage any sort of professional advice to help you buy and sell because that's your goal. Um, but what what happens with us is sometimes we have business owners that are pretty savvy. They know their valuation. They know what they're you know they're looking to do as far as selling or buying and they just want that connection um, so as far as what we do is we provide self-serve ads where they create their own listings they promote it on our site and then we're doing a great job from a digital marketing perspective and a social selling perspective of attracting these like mind people uh, that are looking for existing opportunities to purchase and we just connect them um, now, if there's ever a, an instance where uh, there's a small business owner or, or a franchise owner that says, uh, hey, listen, I want to sell, but I'm not comfortable creating my own listing or doing it myself. I need professional help. That's actually where we'll refer them to a business broker to help them. So there's a lot of partnership and, and working together. So it's not like market. you're trying to like push away the business brokers and be that instead. It's a Absolutely collaboration not. between everybody. Yeah, we're trying to provide some options that kind of fit unique circumstances, right? Well, and Not I've, I've seen a lot of like business broker, uh, business website ones that are just like online, digital, small things, right? But you had like hair salons and like offline stuff, which was quite unique. I haven't seen a lot of uh, sites like that. So what made you decide to go that route? Because that's all over. Yeah. So we felt that, you know, when we were creating this brand and creating this marketplace, we wanted to create, um, you know, a top of mind brand uh, by consolidating all sorts of opportunities uh, and users into one convenient marketplace. Um, so, you know, a prime example is uh, Auto Trader. Um, if people are looking to buy and sell cars, they think, okay, Auto Trader is a good 
good place to start. We want to start that that uh, top of mind branding as well, uh, where if people are looking to buy or sell businesses, they think Bizon. Uh, and when they come to our site, uh, we have opportunities that fit their search their search criteria. Uh, we have you know we have outliers. We have opportunities as little as a thousand dollars to opportunities as as big as you know a couple million dollars. But that sweet spot is around one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars that these small business owners and franchise owners are looking to sell for. One of my clients just sold his business. I wish I was paying more attention and would have looked at all the interviews I had coming up sooner than that because it is one of those things where um, it's you literally are like, okay, I'm ready. Now what, <laughs> right? Uh, unless you get a business broker or somebody that can sort of connect people together. But auto trader for buying and selling businesses, that's a huge vision. And you have to sort of, I'm assuming, chunk it and take it up piece by piece. So how did you... A, decide to go that huge because you don't have to, um, mm-hmm. and B, take those first necessary steps in order to do it. Yeah, I think I think when it comes down to, it comes down to, uh, I love challenges. Uh, I love, you know, my passion is creation. Uh, I like building out campaigns. I like building out businesses that add value to, to uh, you know, people's lives. Uh, and I think in our situation, uh, we, you know, when you're talking about either uh, newcomers to, to the U.S. or Canada looking for American and Canadian companies um, or just overall people looking for opportunities, we want to try and provide them the most diversified, uh, you know, search engine with all sorts of opportunities to satisf- satisfy their appetite. Uh, so for me, it was always about, you know, creating a strong brand and creating something bigger where people actually see value in. Um, and then I think from this point forward, you know, to, to satisfy that, it, it's all about creating a top of mind brand uh, and attracting these engaged buyers and sellers that believe uh, in the power of being a small business owner, that believe in the power of entrepreneurship. Okay. And what we were talking about before is that you don't have to be a startup. You don't have to be that person, right? You can buy a business. But I've also seen a lot of people get really scared because there's a lot of investment, whether it be franchise or not. Um, And if you don't have a lot of business experience, it can be super, super scary. So give me sort of a step-by-step on what people can do to make sure that they're A, buying the right business and B, making sure that it's as successful, fingers crossed, as humanly possible. Yeah. And, you know, to start off first, I think, you know, we're really trying to spearhead the whole um, concept of entrepreneurship through acquisition. So you're, you know, being an entrepreneur is just not starting something from scratch, but we also believe it's, you know, buying something existing and making it better. Um, Now, as far as the investment, uh, people don't understand when you're starting a business from scratch, there's a huge investment in that. It's called your time, right? Uh, People don't think it's as serious as money, but I do. You know, you can waste a ton of time. And at the end of that journey, you figure out, oh, wow, I try to create something and there's no market fit. It's not successful, right? Now, when it comes to buying something existing, you know, we always tell our people, um, you know, you're, you're buying something with a market fit. You're buying something that provides a shorter return on investment because it's a live breathing uh, business that you you have impact with right away. Um, in order to mitigate your risk, we always tell people, you know, try and look for a business that's self-sufficient, meaning that it's not dependent on one leader or one supplier or one customer. Um, because what we notice is that that businesses that are dependent on one person or one vendor, one customer, when you get into that business, it could be tricky. Clients leave, suppliers don't want to deal with the new owners possibly. So you really want to find something self-sufficient. Uh, the next is recurring. You want to find a business that has, you know, recurring revenue. Um, it, it doesn't have these vicious peaks and valleys that could be scary. Uh, and then the last is uh, timing. Uh, I always like to say, you know, if you're looking to buy or sell uh, a taxi company right now today, yeah. may not be the best, best, best opportunity to go for um, an e-commerce business. Why not? Right. Uh, so look at timing, look at economic trends and and social trends to, to, to mitigate as much risk as possible. But I think it just comes down to, you know, with all those things in mind is really, really looking at what do you want to do with your life? What are you passionate about? What's your purpose? Because at the end of the day, we're seeing, you know, millennials coming in flocks because they're trying to get away from that traditional nine to five and they're looking to be their own business owner and do something that really satisfies them, something that they wake up every morning loving. So, yeah. 
<laughs> That's it. So tell me a little bit more, though, especially on the skill set side. So if a, there's a millennial coming in and they had a nine to five job and they're like, I'm just going to buy a business. And yet they have no business experience. <laughs> right. What sort of skill sets should they have? Because that's the other piece is that you're playing with a little bit more fire when you jump into something that's already running versus if you're starting something from scratch and have like a longer learning curve. Sure. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I think, you know, I, I heard this advice actually when it came to starting a business, but I think it's still, you know, it still makes sense for even, uh, buying an established business. You know, uh, you are buying an established business with, with employees and clients and whatnot. So you have to have some experience of running a, and operating a company, right? Um, or, or you probably will set up, set yourself up for failure. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, starting something from scratch or buying something from uh, that's existing, um, I heard this advice where, you know, don't get rid of the stability of your nine to five, mm. just work even harder. So if you can find a nine to five that provides you uh, with the most amount of money for the least amount of work, go for that until you're satisfied with your startup or your existing business that, it's providing the revenue uh, and the experiences that can basically replace that nine to five. So if someone's contemplating that, I, I wouldn't say get rid of the nine to five. I would say try and balance both, but out the gate, absolutely. If you're going to buy an existing business or franchise, you need to have the skill set and, and the mindset uh, to run your business and, and hire employees and, uh, and treat your customers and employees right and, and whatnot. Right. Yeah, it's hard to know the skill set before you have the the way to do it. So that's the thing that's <laughs> tough. Yeah, well, I know, right? The problem of our world. But when but when we're we're looking at going into a business in general, and I help people get their business ready for sale quite often, right? Like let's yes. be the owner instead of not just working in the business. How mm -hmm. often when you're looking at the the plethora of businesses to buy, do you have to have a role that you fit into in order to actually run it also. Cause most businesses aren't that self-sufficient in general. Um, and you kind of have to work in the business for a while. So you tell me, and when we're looking at everything, do you, will you have to have 20, 40 hours a week as soon as you hop in, or is it easy to transition like a nine to five without having to be in it? So, so I think, uh, when it comes to, uh, transitioning, uh, a lot of times the existing owners, they help you with that transition period, usually three to six months, uh, to get, to, 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 to get used to the, to the business and, and whatnot. But I think those, those questions are, are answered through due diligence, like way in advance. Um, as far as putting in time, uh, when, especially in our marketplace, you're talking about smaller businesses. So you, you may not just be, uh, the business owner, but you may have a day to day uh, role in the operations uh, of running that business. And if you're passionate about it and you're excited about that business, you need to be prepared to put in time. It's not, you know, uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition is not a replacement of the grind. You know, it, you know, the grind will still be there. You'll still have to hustle. You'll still have to work, you know, uh, you'll, but the thing is you'll have that impact. You're the leader, you're the owner. Um, but it's not going to replace that grind. Um, what it will replace is you being depressed at your desk nine to five, doing something you absolutely hate. That's what it'll replace. See, I appreciate you saying that though. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, you buy a website business and it just throws off cash. Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, Oh my gosh, people, businesses have so many aspects. And unfortunately a lot of people don't understand that as they dive in, especially if they're not mm -hmm. used to it. Um, yeah. so how can and they I'll find that stuff sorry, out? Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I'll no, give no. you exa two examples. Yes. One is, um, people <laughs> that, that, that they'll, they, they say, Hey, listen, I have a business, but we're just going to start a website because people just come. No, no, not true. That's not going to happen. But there's a you quote need... about if you build it, they will come, right? I thought that's <laughs> yeah. how it was supposed to work. No, no <laughs> not true at all. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, what happens is, um, when, when you're, when you're diving deep into thinking that, Hey, the hard work is that replacement. That's when bad things start to happen. And, you know, one example is uh, restaurants. You know, there's so many turnovers with restaurants because people think, hey, that's like a gateway easy business to operate. Um, you know, that's my chance at doing something easy. They jump in three months down the road. They're like, oh my God, this is so hard. I just did this because I thought I'd be making a ton of money uh, and I thought it'd be easy. And then, you know, they're selling and flipping, right? Um, 
if you get into it for the money or because you think it's easy at the first, at the first signs of difficulty, you're going to quit. You know, that's why passion and purpose is so, so important today. Tell me the difference. Times. Yeah, because there's always, everybody listening to this show knows that there's those times. Every, every entrepreneur, oh. no matter how successful, has those times. Exactly. But can, how can we tell the difference? Because I remember chatting with my best friend and she had helped uh, a million, well, a couple million dollar company grow, but from the inside, right? So she was an intrapreneur. And then mm -hmm. she did her startup and she's like, they're very different, <laughs> right? Like having resources versus having no resources. So what type of person should do acquisition versus the startup side? So great question. So I think that startup entrepreneur is someone that has a passion for building out businesses. So building, creating something from scratch. Like for example, me, I love building businesses from scratch. I love seeing an idea and a vision and then doing what it takes in order to attract the right team, uh, be creative on literally zero resources, uh, attracting the financing in order to just have this real life uh, vision come to life. Right. And that, you know, that's, that's, that's what it takes to be a startup uh, entrepreneur is that grind and hustle. Um, an act, an entrepreneur through acquisition doesn't so much have to go through that grind of the startup phase, but they're good. They're an operator. They're a builder. They're, they're good at running a business, um, at, you know, uh, at customer service, at taking care of their employees and running a, a, an existing business to run day to day. Um, you know, there's a ton of startup entrepreneurs that aren't operators, you know, that can't, you know, continue running a business. They build the business, they launch it and, you know, they're looking to hire a CEO, right? So I think the biggest difference is startup entrepreneur is a, a creator uh, and, and an entrepreneur through acquisition is, is an operator. Huh. So do, can you have a creator or visionary or whatever you want to call it buy a business or should they not? Uh, I don't think they would want to. You'll, you'll, you know, I don't, I honestly don't think okay. because, because look how crazy this is. Mm -hmm. I started this marketplace where people could buy existing businesses and franchises. I believe in it. I believe in entrepreneurship through acquisition. Ask me if I would buy an existing business or franchise. Would you buy an existing business? I'm a builder. I like creating things from scratch. Am I an operator as well? Yes, I actually am. That's why, you know, I'm leading my team and whatnot, but I, I'm a combination of both. Mm -hmm. So well, would I have no problem buying an existing business? Absolutely. I could operate it no, hands down. I'm very confident in my abilities, right? But my passion is creation. So if you talk to a passionate entrepreneur that wants to build, most likely I say 75%. But say, no, I'd rather try and build it out than start something from scratch because I have this innovation or this idea that is different than anything out there maybe. Oh, okay. So there's a distinction then too. Because in my head, I help so many business owners and I'm like, you know what? I shouldn't just take their money and or uh, pieces of it. I should just go buy my own and then take the exact same advice and then go, go do that there and run those teams, right? Uh, as a lot of work, hence the reason why I haven't done it yet. Um, but in my head, I, I'm not, I don't call call myself an operator. I want somebody else to do all of that. So I, sure. that's why I was so intrigued to be like, okay, should it just be the operator versus the visionary um, mm -hmm. on how that goes? Because I want to make sure that when people are listening, they're sort of pre-qualifying themselves, <laughs> right, on, uh, on this idea of acquisition instead, mm -hmm. right? Especially if they don't have a lot of time already and the startup phase does take a really long time. I've had a lot of uh, friends specifically take years before they can quit their day job because of trying to make sure that they have the amount of money coming in. And it seems like it could be faster if they buy one instead, technically. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs through acquisition, uh, whether they have cash or financing, it's, it, you know, like I said before, they're in, investing or acquiring uh, um, a live breathing business uh, that's making money. So the return on investment is way shorter than starting something from scratch. Um, you know, a startup entrepreneur has to be okay with the fact that you may not be making money for five years until it hits critical mass or, or, or profitability or whatnot. Uh, an entrepreneur through acquisition, uh, maybe due to their lifestyle, may not have as much time or patience on their hand uh, and want to jump into something right away. So do you think that somebody who is technically a visionary shouldn't buy a business? I don't, like, like I said, I'm just talking about myself. Yeah. Um, 
but I, you know, I don't like, let's look at this example, uh, Howard Schultz of Starbucks. He's a visionary. He's, he's, he's an unbelievable CEO. Um, he bought Starbucks. It was an existing business. He bought that coffee company and he grew it into a multi-billion dollar empire, right? So there's that example. So I think there's always, you know, examples of, of visionaries buying existing businesses. But if we had to draw that line in the sand, hmm. you know, most of the times I would say, hey, visionaries um, or startup entrepreneurs would probably rather create a business from scratch and operators uh, would probably be better to buy an existing business. So, but th- every example is different. Every example is different. Definitely. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about the the buying side, right? So let's say you're a startup entrepreneur and you're like, hmm, I want to build this company to sell. What's the mm-hmm. best thing that they can do? So that way people will want to buy it in droves and they actually make a profit on it. Cause you know how much time they probably put into it. Yeah. So it is, I I came up with, you know, the three pillars of creating a valuable and sellable business. And it's the same thing that buyers look for when they're looking to buy a business, literally create a self-sufficient business, Mm -hmm. uh, have timing on your hand and focus on recurring revenues, profitable recurring revenues that are growing. (laughs) Profitable. Valid distinction. (laughs) Right. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, buyers want to see, you know, you know, at least three years of financials uh, to normalize some sort of projection. Right. Um, but another, another creative angle uh, as well for startup entrepreneurs is, and I think this is cool too, cause it t- kind of ties in is, uh, don't be afraid to eat up other companies that complement what you're creating. That's a great, that is a great way to accelerate growth. Mm. Right. Um, so that kind of balances that, that creator with that operator. Can you tell me a little more about, I've had clients do that and sometimes it's for, for wonderful things. And sometimes you're like, oh, they took on more than they could chew. Right. And so, and we don't want it to hurt the other company, the existing company that you already have. So give us some examples or the trajectory of what they should do if they are going to, to eat up some other companies that are similar. Um, so, so, you know, other than focusing on those three pillars, um, I think it comes down to understanding um, the, the culture at that company, right? Uh, understanding uh, who, who's going to be affected uh, directly and indirectly through that acquisition. Um, that transition period is important to make sure that um, employees or suppliers or vendors of that uh, of that business that you're looking to acquire uh, don't get slapped in the face. Well, and that's uh, give me some tips on that because that's the thing. You're you're when this happens, you're like, oh, that employee sucks. That one does too. You can only do so much due diligence beforehand, right? And there's a whole bunch of stuff. So give us some tips on mitigating that transition and what we can expect for loss of customers or clients or vendors or whatever. Yeah, it's hard to answer that because every acquisition is uniquely different. Um, but when you're when you're going through due diligence, you're you're praying that you're a- asking the right questions. There's full transparency um, and communication is top priority uh, with with shareholders and directors of that acquired business and possibly employees as well. Um, you are right though. Sometimes what happens is through acquisitions, the last people to find out are employees uh, and the retention of employees may be affected depending on how strong the culture is uh, and how, you know, how, how strong the culture is and how, I guess, um, you know, positive they're looking at this acquisition to be. Um, but it's very hard to, to answer what to expect because every acquisition is so different. Okay, then give us the due diligence process. What would you do if you, if you were going to buy a business right now? Give me the steps on due diligence to make sure we are asking the right questions in case something blows up after we do. <laughs> Yeah. For, so, so for me, I think, you know, um, looking, looking at the, the financials, obviously of the business, uh, is extremely important. What are we looking uh, for within that? So, so, you know, a lot, of, like I said before, it's a lot about recurring revenues, strong EBITDA. So you could apply some sort of valuation to the company. Um, you, you obviously want to buy a business that's not overpriced, but you also want to be respectful of the valuation uh, and you don't want to underprice it. Because what happens is a lot of business owners are looking to sell. They're sometimes not always looking to sell to the highest offer. They're, so, they're looking to sell to the business owner that they believe in. Um, that they believe in their skills and they believe they'll carry on their legacy. Because it's their baby, uh, yeah. It's their, 
So maybe, right? So I think, I think when it comes to that type of transaction, there's a lot of due diligence from the seller's point of view too that a lot of people don't consider. They think that the buyer's in power most of the times, uh, but the seller's in power too. Uh, because for every entrepreneur, like you said, it's their baby, they're protective, they wanna make sure they're handing it off to the right hands. Um, other than that, you know, you wanna jump into culture as well. You wanna see- Well, and actually before we go to culture, when, on the finance, who do they hire? And, and a lot of people don't know what EBITDA means or anything like that. Oh, okay. So who? how do we get the information? Because most people, I'm just saying, stay away from finance. <laughs> they, they don't know yeah. what to expect, they don't know what to look at, they most likely will have to hire somebody to help them with a the due diligence. So what do they do on that? Okay, so EBITDA, earnings before interest tax, uh, depreciation and, and amortization. Um, one thing is to, so Bizon's on that, that little line of that journey. Once you hit due diligence, we always say, like we are very um, loud about saying, hey, make sure you have the acquisition team, your accountant, your lawyer, your banker, and then obviously your matchmaker, which we like to say Bizon. Um, so when it comes to your accountant, uh, they're probably the number one professional to help you look at those finances. Um, if you're looking to get the business um, or, or uh, evaluate the business as far as uh, from a valuation perspective, uh, if you don't want to source out a chartered uh, professional accountant, you could also chart, uh, source out a, a, chart, a chartered business evaluator. Um, that are their their laser focus on doing that and that's it. Um, so from a finance perspective, you, you could approach it that way. Do you have anybody that you can recommend or do you guys have specific referrals for some of that stuff? Because it's hard to find somebody that has your best interest at stake. Yeah. So for, for us, the core of what we do is we connect uh, buyers and sellers. But what we also do is we're trying, well, not trying, we've successfully done this, is create a community where people could um uh, you can have access to tips, tools, perks, and resources. Um, and one of those resources is uh, support services. So for example, if someone wanted to connect with an accountant, lawyer, charter, business evaluator, uh, marketer, HR professional, whatever the case is, they could submit that inquiry through our marketplace. And then we connect them with our preferred partners, which we have a ton of. So how do you how do you pre-qualify preferred partner? Because I, I do referrals for people for everything, for accountants, for, you know what I mean? I'm like, only work with them. I don't trust anyone else, right? Because there's so many not good people out there. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So how do, you, how do you qualify them? Service. So they, from a service perspective, they definitely have to align with, uh, with Bizon. Um, and then uh, we, we have extensive interviews um, and, and agreements in place as well to mitigate any sort of, of risk of, of engaging in a prefer, with a preferred partner that doesn't align with what we represent. Oh, so there's a whole, so do you like attract them or do you exactly. ask them, like, tell me more about that side of things. Cause I've never yes. done this and I'm interested. Yeah, no, we vent, we, we definitely vent them out. Um, I think it's a balance of attracting them and also, uh, them coming to us. Um, so, so, you know, that's, we definitely vent them out from that perspective, but, uh, we're not aggressively going to every single, uh, say accountant in, in, X area saying, Hey, be a preferred partner, be a preferred partner. You know, we're balancing exclusivity as well, um, with quality. Okay. So do they, what's that business model side of things? Do they pay like, a, is it like Dave Ramsey's certified, whatever they are, um, so that they pay monthly or something like that to be a preferred partner for referrals or how does that work? Believe it or not, most of them, um, and it comes down to, to honesty and, and transparency as well. Um, if there's a, an agreed conversation on, we could really engage in reciprocal partnership, mm -hmm. meaning that, hey, if someone's looking for an accountant, we have no problem sending them in your way. But if you do have a conversation with clients or anyone in your network looking to buy or sell a business, please send them our way. If we could agree that there is a true reciprocal partnership, that's how we like to approach it. Uh, but if there isn't, uh, sometimes we share on the success of our of our partner, meaning that you know we sent them clients. They said, "Hey, listen, I don't really engage with people that are looking to buy or sell, so we'll engage in an agreement where if there is success, we share in that success together, like a referral fee or whatever it is that you do." Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So now that we went over the finance part, when Took a little detour. Now, sure. now, now what, what are the other pieces of the due diligence that makes a big difference? Especially culture, uh, we were going down that path. So, so culture, I think um, it, it comes down to that transition period as well. Um, when, when you're jumping into a new, uh, a new business, you have to understand that you're the outsider. Yeah. 
right? So you need to do a great job at communicating with all the important stakeholders, uh, understanding, you know, uh, what they've done in the past to bring them to this point. So you don't replay issues or successes, uh, learn from the failures. And it's a, it's a big due diligence um, when, you, when you're talking about culture because you know, a lot of the times people interview the employees that are there as well uh, to understand you know, their thoughts on, on the business and what to change and what not to do. Um, what I would recommend for anyone listening to this, to this uh, uh, podcast here is uh, uh, there's a book, it's called The First 90 Days. Okay. Um, and that's a great, you know, most, it, it, it generally talks about um, managers or CEOs jumping into a new corporation hmm. for the first 90 days. Uh, but it definitely applies to, you know, a new owner jumping into a new business. Uh, what Maybe to you do- should write the book on the new owner jumping into the new business. <laughs> but there's so many similarities. <laughs> So no, but it's true. So uh, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, things to discuss, you know, and approaches to consider when jumping into uh, a new corporate job uh, that definitely apply with someone that's looking to jump into a new uh, a new business that they just bought. Yeah, it's insane. There's just so many pieces. Like as a coach, I go and I talk to employees, and I was like, "That's not okay." There's so many different facets to what people see. Uh, is it's insane, and because it can be so many different things, um, yeah. you hopping in and doing a massive amount of due diligence is huge. Because imagine you leave lose a key employee, and then go, "Oh, there goes all that." Now you have to solve that problem while you're at a day job. That's that's yeah. a lot. And and I think you know why it's sort of hard to, to answer as well is because every situation is truly unique. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, from a seller perspective, this is, you have to understand probably five years into planning to create a sellable and valuable business. It's not like the, the seller is waking up and saying, Hey, I'm going to sell this business. Um, Cause if they are, it's not going to be successful. And from a buyer perspective, it's a lot of soul searching, uh, you know, and understanding what they want to do with their life, what they, what they believe, you know, being self-aware of their capabilities of what they, they're going to love, have passion for, and what they believe they have the skill, um, to, to operate a, you know, an existing business. And then it gets down to the nitty gritties of, of, you know, due diligence, having those professionals to help you, um, navigate through the finances and, and going through that. And from a culture perspective, really understanding that business. Uh, from a deep perspective at the roots, you know, why was it created? Who are the vendors? Uh, how, how does, you know, uh, the revenue look from those peaks and valleys, uh, employee retention, uh, customer satisfaction, you know, it's really jumping into all these facets of the business that are important. Um, but every, every approach is uniquely different. Well, and a lot of the times you have to do all that yourself. So the due diligence process can take a ridiculously long period of time, right? It's not like the seller's handing you on a silver platter all of the things. I mean, they'll try, but um, but how long does the due diligence process take or how long should it take? Yeah, I was just going to answer that. So it depends on how big the business is, but you could see, um, you could see uh, including due diligence, a whole uh, purchase and sale process taking anywhere from six to eight to 18 months. It really depends on how big the business is. Um, say businesses within our marketplace are a little bit smaller. So saying, you know, six, six to eight months, uh, could be, could be that timeline for that, that process. What's the, what's the, uh, how do they buy it? Right. Do they usually get a loan for it? Do they get friends and family loan? Like does the uh, seller finance pieces, like you tell me what the most typical way is. So if somebody's like right now want to go on your website, but don't have the cash to buy a business, what do they do? So a lot do have cash, um, especially newcomers to, to Canada and, and the U.S. Uh, they come with cash in their pocket looking to buy into that American or Canadian dream, uh, and they're looking for that existing business. Uh, but uh, there, there is a, there is a, um, a high volume of, of people that finance the transactions as well. And the kicker is it's, it's pretty easy to finance an existing business, uh, especially a, a good existing business. Profitable right? business. Yes, uh, that is exactly. helpful for sure. Right. So I, I, you know, there, there aren't many financial institutions that wouldn't finance uh, a purchase of a, of a, you know, a live breathing money making business. But you stay away from, you don't say like this loan is better than this. I mean, I know you're from Canada anyway, it's different than, than the States, but in general, you sort of stay away from that and just say, do your due diligence and get the best deal. 
Yeah, exactly. I'm not an expert on that. So um, that's that, that would be my approach. <laughs> Be like, okay, hire these. They could you could have preferred partners selling specific things. I'm not sure. Maybe you did. And we do we do yeah. have we do have lending partners as well. So oh, cool. uh, we do we do provide those connections. Uh, we have you know a pretty extensive list of preferred partners that we can pretty much help anyone with any sort of inquiry. Um, but you know when we when we sit back, we have to understand you know we're we're not business brokers at Bizon. And that's why having preferred partners is so important to us because we want to provide that resourceful experience for our users. Um, and uh, and a lot of these preferred partners that we engage with definitely complement what we're doing as a matchmaker. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, you don't have to know all the pieces because you know the people that have all the pieces and you can just, and that's, the, I think, a huge highlight for everybody that's listening because you don't have to know everything. Even when you get into the business, thank goodness, there are other people that know more than you. And it's just that the thing that's tough is finding that trusted relationship of somebody that yes. is going to give you the right advice instead of the what's in it for me advice, which is hard to find sometimes, especially with the people online and doing Google searches to find preferred people. It's tough. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Awesome. I know we have to start wrapping up, but uh, what is, so the last final question, and now everybody's like raring and ready to go to buy businesses. So of course, check out his site and we'll talk about that in just a second. But what is one action besides buying a business, which I know is you know, I'll say it for you. <laughs> what is one action that listeners could take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? I'm going to go really deep on this one. Okay. Okay. And I think it's getting your mind right. Hmm. A lot of, a lot of people, um, really take that, that, that saying as, as fluffy, uh, but it's not, you really need to get your mind right. And you need to focus not on making a million, but how to add value to a million people. I take that to my core every day and I use that every day as motivation that I'm not here to make millions of dollars. I'm here to satisfy millions of people. Uh, and if you approach that in business, that's how you become a millionaire. Because at the end of the day, when your purpose and passion is so deep, that's what really propels you through those hard times. Um, because if you're chasing that money, like I said before, the first sign of difficulty or an obstacle, you're, you're, you're packing it in and saying, I'm done right? The passion and purpose really excels you through that. And that's why so you have the, such a get, big vision. Get your mind right. <laughs> <laughs> Slap them around a little bit. Yes. It's, it's, it's tough though, because it's one thing to say, it's another thing to actually do. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. What do you give? So I know I don't usually ask follow-up questions, but what do you do when you start going after the money side to sort of swing yourself back to the actual impact side? So I like to do the Tony Robbins approach. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, every morning and every, so I start every morning like this and finish every day. I take three minutes to just not think. And then I, um, I, I, I tell myself, Hey, what are three things I'm thankful for in my life? And then I ended off with what are three of my goals to accomplish today and in my life that aren't attached to money. I just constantly remind myself that that's what I'm striving for. This is what I'm thankful for. This is these are my goals in life, and none of it has to do with, uh, hey, I want to drive a Rolls Royce. So, uh, my, you know what's weird? There's a lot of people out there that are like, hey, uh, I can't wait till I have a big yacht, and I'm saying to people, hey, I can't wait till you know there's a building with a Bizon logo on it. Oh yeah. I wanna, you know what I mean? Like that's that's what drives me, right? So. Yeah, get your mind right. In my, in, I have a, a vision, a mind movie, and I have exactly the same thing. A very large building with my name. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think drives visionary entrepreneurs. They're like, and I want all of this. And mm -hmm. of course, it symbolizes, and, and money's great and all that fun stuff, and I don't particularly want a yacht. But I think the people that you're talking to uh, listening right now feel the exact same way. They want to make an impact in the world because that makes all the difference. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on the show today. Where can we find more about you? Say the website name again. Make sure you spell it so everybody's got it. And all that fun stuff. <laughs> so yeah, it's, so it's mybizon.com, M-Y-B-I-Z-O-N.com. Um, and yeah, just go there and there's everything. We have all our social links to all our social media accounts. We're, we're big on social uh, selling. So we're always trying to attract and connect with like-minded people that truly believe in, in entrepreneurship through acquisition. And you can go search like you would for a car, but for a business. So it was really fun. I was like going, oh, that looks good. It's not good for people that have ADD that are like, oh, I want to buy this one. Oh, that sounds great too. I could help exactly. this one, right? Yeah, Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you and have a fantastic day. Bye.